Good afternoon to all my opera buddies in Tidewater and Hampton Roads. I'm happy to be back with you again in the plush luxury of the WHRO studios to talk about an opera that many of you think you know and many of you think you like. That's Mozart's Magic Flute. We in the opera biz call this a cash cow, you know, uh, every opera company, in order to more or less subsidize some of the unfamiliar works they might be presenting in a season, they get some guaranteed box office hits. That's the function of Carmen that we'll uh, be talking about in the spring of 2014. And also, uh, Mozart's Magic Flute, Die Zauberflöte, is a perennial box office champion. Uh, for one thing, people have the idea that it's kind of a family-oriented opera, maybe even a children's opera. The Metropolitan Opera has a special abridged children's version that they do in English. We at Virginia Opera will be doing ours in English as well. And uh, it, it, people have warm fuzzies when it comes to this opera. Uh, but I don't think anybody gets it. I think there's a statistically insignificant portion of the populace that has any idea what the magic flute is. Well, prepare to have your world rocked this afternoon. You know, there are people who really love the magic flute. They always look forward to it. They like the spectacle of it, uh, the grandness of it. They like Papageno's funny bird costume, if, if he's got one, and uh, all the silly jokes that Papageno makes and that charming Papageno, Papagena duet that you'll hear several minutes from now. They like uh, the, sub the music is some of Mozart's most sublime. There is no question about that. Uh, people just kind of like everything about it, and those people, 95% of them, again, have no idea what they're watching. No idea what the magic flute is or what it's even about. Now, there are people who are a little less hot about it. They're, I would say maybe they like the magic flute. They agree that the music is divine. Uh, and they like portions of it, but with reservations. There are aspects of it that they wish they could kind of take a red pencil and excise out of there. A lot of dull spots. They like the good parts, but they feel there's a little too much soybean meal in that hamburger. And they wish there was a little more red juicy meat. And I'm telling you, those people have no idea what they're watching, by and large. Uh, unless they have really done some high-level research, they don't know what they're watching. And then there are those who just don't get it at all, don't care for it. No, nope, don't like it. Uh, I like Don Giovanni. I like Mar uh, Marriage of Figaro. <sighs> nope, don't bother asking me to come to the Magic Flute. I have too many problems with it. And, of course, I'm going to tell you that those people don't understand the Magic Flute. Uh, and, folks, if you listen to this broadcast, I'm promising you that approximately an hour from now, you will belong to a really small minority of the human race because you will understand what Mozart was doing when he wrote The Magic Flute. And uh, I hope you feel empowered by that. So let's begin. Um, here are some of the, <laughs> you know, I I'm going to start by tearing down the opera and then we'll build it back up. <laughs> so... What are some of the reservations that those naysayers have or those people who only like parts of the opera? Um, they will say that, well, golly, if it's a children's opera, then why does it have so many boring parts? A bunch of, you know, priestly type people in robes marching around and mumbling uh, ceremonial things. You know, that would put a kid to sleep. What the heck? If, if it's a children's opera, it's the most boring children's opera ever. Plus, it's a little too long. There are those who say it is the worst libretto ever foisted upon an opera composer in the history of opera. Uh, these characters, you know, one reason that most of us really admire Don Giovanni and the Marriage of Figaro is that those characters, Don Giovanni, Leporello, uh, the Donan, uh, the Marriage, uh, you know, Figaro, the Count Almaviva, Susanna, these are not just stock characters. Uh, they are fully developed, complex, three-dimensional, psychologically deep, palpable, flesh and blood human beings. They're written that way in the libretto, but especially Mozart's music just brings them to full, vibrant life. We feel like they're as real as anybody we know. 
And what have you got in the magic flute? You've got kind of a dorky fairy tale. They're not three-dimensional. They're not two-dimensional. They're like stick figures. You know, you've got Tamino, a handsome prince, and he's out hunting one day, and he's being chased by a giant serpent. Oh, no. And three fairies come and kill the serpent. And uh, then they show him a portrait of a beautiful princess, and he looks at the princess, and one glance at her portrait, and verily, he falls deeply in love with her for the rest of his life, with a love that is noble and true. Really? Seriously? You know, right there, it's five minutes into the opera, and uh, Mozart has lost 50% of the audience in this day and age, who are saying, come on, give me a break. Fall in love with her because she's pretty, has a pretty picture. I mean, you know, what if she chews with her mouth open? Well, you know, what if she has a foot odor problem? You don't know these things from looking at a picture. It's just not real life. So, and it goes on like that. You know, the, the, the princess's mother comes and says, Oh, young man, will you be my hero? My daughter has been rescued by an evil wizard, and you must bring her back to, because I love my daughter, blah, blah, blah. So right now, people are asking for a little more reality than Mozart seems to be willing to give them. And it goes on and on. If it's a fairy tale, it's a fairy tale where the plot changes in the middle in a way that just does, seems kind of unprepared for and clumsy and uh, just it, it it starts out as one thing it starts out as fish and it turns into fowl or it starts out as steak turns into lobster this dumb story so uh, th these are just some of the issues and problems that people have oh you're also going to find those who say it's misogynist these priests that come along, you should hear the things they say about women. Why, Mozart hated women. Oh, I'm not going to go see a, a sexist show like that. All right, sit back, grab yourself a cup of herbal tea or the beverage of your choice, and let your kindly Uncle Glenn put all of these issues to rest, because once you understand what Mozart was about and why he wrote it, all of these things become irrelevant, they are moot points, they fade into insignificance, and we understand once again, oh yeah, he's a genius, I forgot. And geniuses are never clumsy, well, I guess they're human, but they are seldom as clumsy as some people seem to think Mozart was in The Magic Flute. Listen, uh, Mozart had a transformational event in the year 1784 that changed his life in a wondrous way. He was accepted in, as a member of a, a Masonic Lodge in Vienna. He became a Freemason. You know, you'll remember from high school or college that the 18th century is often called the Age of Reason or the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, so it's not surprising that Freemasonry was born in the 18th century, in 1717 actually, in England, a secret fraternal order in which the aim of the fraternal members was to achieve true enlightenment, to follow the path of wisdom, morality, and virtue, and lead a more kind of exalted, uh, less secular, less trivial lifestyle. And uh, this spread quickly. Uh, within just a handful of decades, you had uh, just many, many Masonic lodges all over Western Europe and France, going into the Habsburg Empire, in and around Vienna and Salzburg. And uh, some people became Masons eh, the way some people uh, donate to the opera, just to, to have it on their resume, <laughs> you know, so that their neighbors will see that, oh, you look at, look at you, you're an important person. But not Mozart. For Mozart, it filled a void in his life. With his employment history in the court of uh, Salzburg and for the Arch Archbishop of Vienna, he had been treated rudely. You know, composers were often treated like the kitchen help in, in the 18th century. And he was uh, not honored. He was not respected by his employers. And he was bitter and resentful about that. It caused him a lot of angst. And what Mozart found when he became a Freemason is that suddenly... He was treated as a full equal, as a brother, with respect and honor by writers, scientists, intellectuals, the leading citizens. It was thrilling for him, and it really changed his outlook on life. However, 
by the uh, by this time, by the last couple of decades of the 1700s, uh, the tide of public opinion was turning against Freemasonry. Emperor Joseph II, uh, I surmise, was a little bit afraid that these Masons might be prepping themselves for a political power grab. If they're so all-fired wise, who knows, they might think they know more about running the empire than me. So uh, Joseph slashed the number of uh, lodges in Vienna from eight to three and slashed the uh, permittable number of members of Masons from uh, uh, nearly a thousand to I think it was 360. Uh, just keeping a cap on it. And, you know, the, the problem the Masons had was that it was a secret club. It was a little, you know, women were not allowed, a little bit like the Augusta Golf Club in our times. And their initiation rites and their ceremonies, everything about their meetings was secret. Well, friends, it's human nature. You know, if you've got a secret society in your community, you start wondering what the heck they're up to. You'll have people who say, it's a cult. That's what I hear. They snatch people's children and they never see them again. Oh, gosh, that kind of resonates with the magic food, doesn't it? People are afraid of secrets. What them guys doing behind those closed doors? Are they worshiping cats? Are they burning goats on some sort of witch's Sabbath altar? You know, there's a lot of accusation, a lot of dark suspicion, a lot of rumor, a lot of gossip. And the tide of public opinion is going against Freemasonry. Of course, Freemasonry survives, but it is on the decline. And the, uh, Joseph's successor, the Emperor Leopold, really was down on Freemasonry. And it meant everything to Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. So what you must understand is that the magic flute is Mozart's passionate defense of Freemasonry. It is his attempt to pull back the curtain somewhat, and without giving away the farm and revealing all the secrets, the word Freemasonry is never mentioned in this opera, He's pull, nevertheless pulling back the curtain enough to try to change your mind, you suspicious Viennese citizen you. He wants to show you that, no, 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 we're not the occult. We're not doing nefarious, dark things. We're wholesome people. We just want wisdom, truth, beauty, culture, uh, uh, art, and, uh, and noble things, uh, virtue and morality. So he's going to show you the everything that happens, every note of the music and every word of the libretto is symbolic. It's not about a prince who's out hunting snakes. Uh, he's not a prince and it's not a snake. What is it? Well, we'll get into that. Now, this even affects how we process the overture. Um, Mozart's overtures to his operas are uniformly magnificent, and you don't have to understand anything about symbolism or Freemasonry just to appreciate it as great uh, symphonic writing. However, this one is really telling a tale. And to understand it, you must know something about how a candidate for Freemasonry would approach a Masonic lodge or a temple uh, to be considered for membership. First of all, if you are considered unenlightened before you become a member, then symbolically you are in the dark. You are in that darkness of ignorance and confusion and so forth. So uh, the uh, a new initiate would be led to the lodge blindfolded or with a hood over his head. This is where we get our expression hoodwinked, by the way. And you would also be asked to uh, the, the candidate would be asked to go up the steps in a limping kind of fashion uh, to show that your spirit was crippled because you had not yet the sacred brotherhood of your uh, Freemason fellow colleagues. So when uh, now let's listen to a little bit of the uh, Magic Flute Overture. And like many symphonic works, it has a slow introduction. But this one has a double meaning. First of all, listen to the rhythm that you'll hear in the orchestra, which has this long, short, long, short, long rhythmic character. And that symbolizes the candidate for admission limping on his way to the temple, as he's bidden to do by the Masons. And you'll also hear a halting, uh, unconfident 
a kind of a, an overall affect that represents that darkness of confusion and the lack of perfect wisdom. Sounds like this. Now, once inside the temple, you, as the candidate for uh, membership, and I'm speaking to the men in the audience, sorry, ladies, don't even. Just let it go, ladies. It's not your time yet. Uh, you will suddenly have your blindfold removed or your hood whisked off, and you will be blinded by a dazzling light, perhaps a bonfire, perhaps a brilliant chandelier, uh, momentarily blinding you. And again, this would be symbolic. The, uh, the blinding light of wisdom, order, and logic, the opposite of darkness, confusion, and chaos. So how to represent that musically? Mozart chose the most intellectual musical uh, composition that we have in Western music, the fugue. And one by, you'll hear four uh, uh, voices uh, stating a fugal subject or theme, which, by the way, Mozart kind of stole from a Clementi piano sonata, but let's not hold that against him. And when the entire orchestra finally states that theme uh, in a loud fortissimo, that is the blinding light. Are you dazzled? Are you blinded? Well, I would, I'm kind of am. Now, there's something I want to briefly point out about that tutti, when the entire orchestra stated the theme. We had yup up 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 What did you have right there? You had a leap up, bum, ba, and then a descending scale, bum, 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 bum. And you're going to, you actually hear that a few more times during the course of the overture. Right now, we don't know what that means, but I'm going to tell you something. It's got meaning. It has meaning. And we'll hear what that is in just a moment. So remember, a leap up and a scale down. Now, uh, the uh, uh, overture proceeds on its merry way, very uh, dynamic, very thrilling music, and suddenly it grinds to a halt, and we get this. What the heck is this? <laughs> some blasting chords from the brass section. Uh, were you counting them? I got three groups of three. How about you? Yeah, there were nine chords. Well, three, as it turns out, and that was basically three times three, that's a big deal in numerology. Uh, uh, in, in both the Christian religion, and keep in mind, Freemasonry was born in a Judeo-Christian culture, and also in Freemasonry, they kind of borrow a few aspects of Judeo-Christian culture, including the number three. Now, it does not mean the Holy Trinity in Freemasonry, uh, but everything there, very concerned with the number three. 
Uh, it stands for one thing, the three levels of membership. There were three stages of membership in Freemasonry. Um, but it has other symbolic meanings. It stands for, you know, truth, beauty, wisdom. It stands for uh, the three most important senses, sight, hearing, and feeling, and so forth. It is a sacred number to the Freemasons. By the way, a number of the buildings in downtown Washington, D.C. Uh, were designed by Masonic architects. For instance, next time you're in town up there, look at the Federal Reserve Building, which has three doors and so forth. Lots of triangles in Masonic architecture. So basically what that does when it interrupts the overture in that way is uh, it's summoning the Masons to greet the new candidate. It's a ceremonial uh, call to, uh, calling uh, to, of the meeting to order, if you will. So that takes care of the overture. Now, uh, Mozart understood that when people came to this show, there would be folks who really didn't give a, a hoot about symbolism, about philosophy, about wisdom, about ma ma Masonic lodges or any of it. They just wanted a good show. So he's got a couple of tasks here uh, when the curtain goes up in scene one. For the regular crowd that's going to make it a box office hit and doesn't care about high-minded things, it needs to be a, an action-packed opening. You know, just like Don Giovanni had an action-packed opening of a woman trying to escape her seducer and screaming for help. Well, here we have a giant serpent who is chasing a hunter named Tamino, and he has no arrows. I can't kill it. Someone help me. Help me. Zu Hilfe. Zu Hilfe. Don't worry. We're doing it in English. When suddenly three fairies, you can call them three ladies, come and kill it dead with their magic wands. That's the surface meaning. Listen to it, and we'll talk about it on the other side. something for the uh, theater goers, but it's also something for the audience Mozart really wants to talk to, those who don't get it about Freemasonry. And what does it all mean? Um, Tamino is a symbol. He is not a prince. He's not a real person. He is a symbol. He is a symbol, a symbol of the kind of guy who might be one of Mozart's friends or neighbors or just a, 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 a citizen of Vienna who is educated somewhat intellectual, noble-minded, virtuous, who wants that a, a virtuous, noble life, but who is ill-equipped to uh, find it on his own. You know, the, um, the Freemasons really believe that uh, old Hillary Clinton line, that it takes a village. Uh, they believe that a man cannot reach his full potential as uh, an enlightened man on his own. You must have a brotherhood. Who You must lift each other up and help each other attain this lifestyle. And so th the snake is not a snake. The snake uh, are, uh, are the impediments that men find in overcoming their baser natures and achieving an exalted life. That's what the snake is. And uh, Tamino has no arrows in his quiver to kill the snake because on his own he is not equipped to conquer his base instincts and become an enlightened man. And so uh, the uh, he faints and he is uh, unconscious when the three fairies come. And this is another bit of symbolism that the Freemasons borrow from Christianity. You know, in the New Testament we're told that ye must be born again. You must have a new life once you have accepted the Christian religion. Well, the Freemasons also believed that new members must die a symbolic death. That they must, uh, uh, what, what is dying in them is their old secular 
trivial way of life and that they now have a new life in their fraternal brotherhood of their fellow Masons. So Tamino has just undergone his... Uh, uh, his uh, symbolic death, and of course, it's no coincidence that there are three fairies. By the way, there's something that you ought to be thinking about here. There's a certain Walt Disney movie called Sleeping Beauty. Uh, does that have someone who's unconscious, awaiting a new life? Does it have three fairies named Flora, Fauna, and Meriwether? And does it have a giant snake, a big serpent monster that must be dispatched? Yeah. And guess what, friends of mine? Walt Disney was a Freemason. How about that? I told you I was going to rock your world. Uh, the Sleeping Beauty is very much uh, kind of the magic flute. And there's another uh, story you're familiar with that's based on magic flute. I'll tell you about in a little while. So... Um, the, the three ladies disappear after singing a lovely trio in which they argue about which one of them gets to stay with the really cute, handsome prince while the others go tell the queen. And uh, finally, they all leave. Uh, Tamino wakes up, and he's going to meet uh, his friend, the Scarecrow. Oops, pardon me. It's not Dorothy meeting the Scarecrow. It's Prince Tamino meeting the funny bird man, Papageno, but guess what? The Wizard of Oz is the other story that closely parallels the magic flute. Uh, Papageno is a bird man. He's often portrayed half man, half bird, covered in feathers. He's a bird catcher. Uh, he is silly, makes dumb jokes. He's not the smartest guy on the block. And he's going to meet and become friends with Tamino, and they're going to go on their way to meet the evil wizard, Sarastro. <laughs> It's kind of sounding familiar, isn't it? Uh, so Tamino is Dorothy. And let's meet Scarecrow, Oops, Papageno, who has uh, got a different kind of music to sing. Uh, you know what? What you're about to hear, Papageno introducing himself, this isn't opera music. How about that? <laughs> So what am I talking about? Of course that's opera music. It's in an opera. You've heard it all your life. Well, yeah, but it wasn't written for an opera singer, and it's not really operatic in its vocal demands. Any of you listening to me right now, so long as you can match pitch and carry a tune, you could sing that song right now. It has no high notes. It doesn't call for technical bravura vocally. Da -da -dum -dum, da -da 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 -dum -dum -dum. It's in the low to middle range where an amateur could sing it, because guess what? An amateur opera singer was singing it. Emmanuel Schikaneder, who was Mozart's collaborator, um, helped him write the libretto. I know he's often given credit for being the librettist, but trust me, when it comes to these opera geniuses, the opera is always the composer's work product. And Mozart, trust me, had a direct hand in deciding what every patch of dialogue and every musical number was going to be, because this was his mission to defend Freemasonry. So who is Papageno? What does he represent? Well, he actually is the mirror image of those audience members who didn't care about uh, fancy philosophy or Freemasonry or symbolism, who just thought it was cool when the snake came out, <laughs> and who just want an entertaining story and a, uh, a, you know, a nice tune or two. Papageno is every man. Uh, he is the type of Viennese citizen who is not going to be a member of a Freemason Lodge, but we don't look down on him for that. You know, this is where um, Freemasonry is a little more like graduate school or college than it's like uh, uh, any kind of religion. Religions want everybody. Uh, if you're a, ch a Christian church, everyone is welcome. Everybody come in, rich, poor, you know, it doesn't matter, good, bad, we, we want all of you. The Freemasons don't. 
They're a little more like the dean of admissions at your local college. You know, not everybody needs a college education, right? We need people to drive the garbage trucks, people to pick the bananas. We need, we need workers. Papageno is a working guy. Papageno is the guy who is going to have a happy life, but he is never going to ask himself, what is the meaning of life? Why are we put here on this planet? Papageno doesn't care about wisdom, enlightenment, truth, beauty, blah. Papageno, the only question Papageno ever asks is, what time is lunch? That's as deeply as he thinks. And so that's why his uh, music is not operatic. It's a folk song because he's a man of the people. He represents the common man. Now, uh, the three ladies come back. They have a message from the Queen of the Night. They show uh, Tamino this portrait of the Princess Pamina. And this is the hokey, ch supposedly cheesy part of the plot where the boy looks at the girl and, oh, instantly his heart take wings, takes wings and he is in love with a love that is noble, pure, and true, blah, blah, blah. Very unrealistic, right? Well, at least give Mozart this. It's an ardent, romantic, beautiful love song. Ladies, I hope some man has sung to you like this at some point in your life. How can I adjust your attitude about this moment of the opera? Well, I've got two ways to do it. First of all, yes, it's gorgeous. But did you hear the opening melody? Ta yam da 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 da. Now, were you listening about 10, 12 minutes ago when we were talking about the overture? What did I say, students? I said that at the crest of the, uh, at the climax of the fugal exposition in the fast part of the overture, the, uh, the orchestra went a leap up of the interval of a sixth, followed by a descending scale. We didn't know what it meant in the overture, but now Mozart's hoping we recognize it because Tamino just sang the same musical motive, the same melodic phrase. So now, and what's he singing about? He's singing about true love. Now we have a clue. And you know who was really paying attention to this when he conducted it was Richard Wagner. Richard Wagner goes, oh, that phrase stands for the concept of the sanctity of marital love, of true love between a man and his mate. Wow, a musical phrase can represent a concept or an idea. Note to self, let's use that in all of our operas. Forever, hallelujah, amen. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Wagner learned a lot from the magic flute. And what about this problem that we have with the drama, with the theatricality, that the, it's so unrealistic that he falls in love instantly because he sees her picture? Well, again, if you, Mozart was here and you complained to him directly, what he would say is, duh, he's not a real person. <laughs> Don't you get it? He's a symbol. None of this is real. Papageno is not a bird catcher. He's the guy who's never going to go to college. The queen of the night is not a queen. I'll tell you who she is in a minute. Tamino is not a prince. He's the educated Viennese man who, given a chance, might embrace Freemasonry. Stop taking it literally. Um, it's symbolic. Uh, he falls in love with Pamina instantly because she is the mate that he's destined to enter into the holy bonds of matrimony with. So, of course, he's going to love her. He's going to identify her when he sees her symbolically. Let it go, people. It's a different kind of theater. Now, the queen of the night comes out, and she 
sings a famous aria in which she tells a sad tale. She says, good, I'm glad you fell in love with her because I have a job for you, fella. I need a knight in shining armor. She tells a sad, uh, it's a two-part aria. She tells a sad tale about, oh, this evil wizard, this horrible villain named Zarastro took my daughter. He abducted her in the middle of the night, and my heart was broken, and I listened to her screaming in terror. Help me, help me, and I was powerless to help her, and now my heart is bereft, bereft, I tell you, and I want her to come back to me, and I don't know what I'll do, and she's very compelling. Here she is, crying tears. Now, are they crocodile tears? That's the question, but she, she's very compelling. I'm convinced. Sign me up. I'll go rescue the girl. And then she sings the fast coloratura portion. And of course, Queen of the Night is one of the great coloratura roles ever put on the stage, requiring incredible, it's like turning the human voice into a clarinet or a flute or a violin. And she's very animated now because she turns to Tamino and says, you, you will go rescue her and then you can have her hand in marriage. Uh, and ladies, don't try singing this like this at home. You might hurt yourselves. <laughs> and the Scarecrow, oops, pardon me, Tamino and the Birdman, Papageno, are going to go down the yellow brick road, oops, pardon me, off to mythological Egypt, and they're going to try to find the wizard, oops, I mean Zoroastro, and uh, take care of business. Now, what did Dorothy and her, oh gosh, how many companions did Dorothy have? Tin Man, Lion, Scarecrow. Yes, yeah, three. Gosh, numerology in The Wizard of Oz. Well, what did they find when they got to Oz? They found to their surprise at the very end of the movie that far from being an evil despot, the wizard was actually, once you pull back the curtain, like Mozart's trying to do here, a kindly, wise old man. And, of course, that's going to be the big plot development in the Magic Flute. Once they get to Zoroastro's kingdom, Tamino and Papageno are going to find out that the queen was, uh, maybe she, was she lying? Was the whole thing a con job? Because Zoroastro is the wisest man in the world, a sage. So what do we make, you know, the queen of the night. Well, doesn't the word night give it away? She's a villain, right? She's a lying uh well, I don't want to get the FCC closing down the stadio. Rhymes with ditch. You know, everything she said, those were crocodile tears. She was lying. She made up the whole thing. And gosh, in act two, she's going to, uh, when Tamino sort of gets sidetracked and doesn't do her bidding anymore, she's going to give a dagger to her daughter, Pamina, and tell her to kill Zarastro and rescue herself. So besides a liar, the queen of the night is a murderess, right? Um, no, none of that is true. Here's something that a lot of people don't understand. Everything she said in that aria you just heard a little couple of snatches from was the truth. She didn't lie. Oh, she was mistaken. She said that Zoroastro is evil, but that wasn't a lie. She's just one of those ignorant people who doesn't understand Freemasonry. She... Uh, the, you know, the people in the audience who uh, might see themselves in the Queen of the Night are the people Mozart's trying to reach but realizes it might be difficult. Again, what does darkness represent? 
in the magic flute? Does it represent evil and sinfulness and wickedness? No. Darkness and night represents ignorance and confusion. The queen isn't lying. She is ignorant. And by the way, everything she said happened, happened. Uh, uh, Zoroastro did take her daughter. The daughter was frightened, and she is heartbroken. The queen of the night isn't really a villain. She's not wicked or evil. She just needs Snopes.com. You know that website where you go to check whether rumors are fact-based or not? If she just had gone to Snopes.com and typed in Zoroastro, we wouldn't have needed a second act, actually, for the whole opera. I'm kidding, but uh, this is what people don't understand. And by the way, this is borne out. You know, the three fairies, uh, the three ladies who killed the snake, uh, they give, they're the ones who give Tamino his gift of the magic flute. Oh, just like Dorothy got her ruby slippers uh, that will help him bail him out of trouble while he's on his quest. And, you know, when they catch Papageno lying, lying, uh, he claims he was the one who killed the snake, and they punish him. We get a nice little quintet in which, among other things, Tamino, Papageno, and the three ladies are moralizing about what a terrible thing it is to be a liar and how the world would be a paradise if only men would learn honesty, which sounds like this. <laughs> When you think about it, this is why a lot of, you know, opera critics take Mozart to task and say, you're just not being consistent. Look, the Queen of the Night is evil, right? And the three ladies, they work for her, right? And at the end, Zarastro's going to banish all of them, the Queen and her ladies, right? So they're wicked too, right? So how come right now they're moralizing about what a terrible thing it is to lie? It's because they're not evil. What they are... They are those people of Vienna who were believe that they are virtuous and noble and want to be good citizens, but who are whispering, gossiping, spreading rumors about Freemasonry, who really believe that those Freemasons are an evil cult. That's why the Queen says she believes that Zoroastro is an evil wizard. This is who Mozart is trying to protect his fraternal brothers from, from the ignorant queens of the nights out there in Vienna and the surrounding areas. So I hope that kind of makes sense to you. And by the way, at the, uh, in the second, the next scene, when the curtain goes up and we're in Zarastro's kingdom, uh, we see Pamina being held by her jail warden, a little creep named Monostatos. And by George, she is frightened. So we're inclined to uh, understand, uh, you know, to to still buy the Queen's story and think that that uh, she's right. Uh, here's Pamino being terrorized by little Monostatos. <laughs> Now, when Tamino arrives at Zarastro's kingdom, this, uh, there is a scene of dialogue with the, one of the priests, not Zarastro, but one of the chief priests. Zara, uh, Tamino arrives at the temple, which will have three doors, and he is barred from entering. Remember, he is the uh, candidate who will fit in, who is a, a, the right kind of person to become a Freemason, but right now he's in that state of chaos, confusion, and ignorance because he's been listening to the Queen. And the preacher, the uh, uh, priest rather, is going to come out and challenge Tamino. No, you may not enter. Why are you here? And Tamino says all the right things. He's saying the things that make the priest look on him favorably. I am looking for virtue, truth, and reason, but here is where the evil Zarastro resides. And the priest is going to say a really important line that Mozart wants you to listen to. He's going to say, what is your reason for saying that? What proof do you have that he is evil? And, Zarast uh, and Tamino says, well, because that's what the queen says. 
in a court of law, we would call that hearsay. <laughs> uh, Mozart, Mozart is the speaker. Mozart is talking not just to Tamino. It's not the priest talking to Tamino. It's Mozart talking to his friends and neighbors in Vienna, saying, all these terrible things you say about us Freemasons, what reason do you have for saying it? What is your proof? And all Tamino can come up with is hearsay. And I'll mention briefly, because I don't want to run too long here, but uh, I mentioned sexism and misogyny. The priest says, well, that's your problem. You've been listening to a woman. You know women. Babble, babble, babble. Uh, men should never listen to women because they just chatter on about nothing all day and they will beguile you and lead you down the garden path. Nope, never listen to women. Uh, be careful about deciding that Mozart hates women and was a sexist. Uh, Mozart actually right there is uh, representing what men did say in Vienna in the 18th century. You know, we don't have suffragettes yet. Women were not full citizens. They couldn't own property. They, you know, couldn't, uh, they were not equal with men. But remember, Mozart's a genius. He's got a few surprises for you before the end of the opera. Well, so we finally meet Zarastro, and, you know, once Zarastro opens his mouth, it's obvious that this is no villain. He just oozes dignity, wisdom, and nobility, and compassion, and benevolence. Uh, George Bernard Shaw, the playwright and music critic, once said that the music written for Zarastro was the only music ever composed which would not sound out of place coming from the mind, uh, from coming from the mouth of God. Uh, listen to his opening words here and see if you get the, there's kind of a musical halo around him. <laughs> So that's our big plot twist. Uh, plot twist. He's no evil wizard. He's the real Wizard of Oz, just a humble guy from Kansas who's actually quite got a down-home folksy wisdom. Well, this is a little more sacred wisdom in this version, but uh, the parallel uh, is valid. Now, in the second act, what's going to happen is we're going to see symbolically uh, a, a new Freemason undergoing the initiation rites, which heretofore have been secret. Mozart's able to get away with this because it's all in code. It is symbolic. You never, they never mention Freemasonry. Supposedly, Tamino is uh, trying to be accepted into the brotherhood of the priests of the Egyptian gods Isis and Osiris. So he can't be, really be accused of giving away the, uh, the, the sacred secrets, but he's a wink, wink, letting us see enough of it to perhaps change our minds if we're one of those gossips in Vienna. And, um, of course, I mentioned before that the Queen of the Night is going to be very disappointed uh, in Tamino, who has turned out not to be the Sir Galahad she was looking for. She sneaks into uh, Zarastro's kingdom with that dagger I mentioned and wants uh, her daughter, who she believes is the victim of a cult, uh, to uh, kill Zarastro. And I'm going to play this because, you know, this is a, a truly spectacular bit of instrumental writing for the voice. As I said earlier, treating the voice like a flute. Uh, this is what we call coloratura uh, uh, singing, and uh, this, I would say, if you've never been to see a, an opera live, and you've never seen a person standing in front of you with sounds like this coming out of, your, uh, out of their throats, it, it's revelatory to know that a human being can actually make sounds like this.
again, don't try that at home. We don't want to have to uh, take you to the emergency room with projectile hemorrhaging from your throat. Uh, but that's um, uh, interestingly, by the way, when we come back in uh, February with our third production of the season, Strauss's Ariadne of Naxos, you'll meet a character, Zerbinetta, who is also a coloratura soprano, and it was Richard Strauss's stated objective with Zerbinetta to write a coloratura aria that would be more difficult than either the Queen of the Night or Lucia de Lammermoor. Uh, so uh, that's the, the sort of the uh, connecting tissue between this opera and the next one that we'll be doing here at the Harrison Opera House. But moving on... Um, the uh, second act, as I say, will be taken up with the initiation of Tamino into, uh, into the priesthood of Isis and Desiris or Freemasonry, however you're going to look at it. Those trials will be silence, fire, and water. And by the way, Pamina is going to go through those with him as well. Now remember what we said about the supposed sexist bias of the magic flute? This is the sort of avant-garde notion that Mozart injected into Freemasonry, being the, ge the genius that he was. It's not just the man who goes through these trials. Pamina will go through them with him, and when he finally enters the Temple of Wisdom and Light, she will enter with him. So don't cherry-pick your moments of the magic flute to decide that it's uh, sexist. Mozart is uh, suggesting something here, a path to, in the future. And Pamina's an interesting girl. Um, she is going to sing the single most gorgeous and beautiful and heartfelt number in the entire opera, her aria Ach ich Fuss. Uh, when her mama tries to uh, put out a hit contract on Zorastro and make Pamina the hitman, uh, Pamina's very upset. She loves Zorastro, does not want to kill him, and when Zorastro approaches her, Pamina basically says, oh, now you're going to hate my mother and you're going to kill my mother because she's tried to make this happen. Zoroastro again is going to demonstrate his dignity, wisdom, and compassion in singing one of his great arias, which I call the Masonic National Anthem because he's stating the basic tenets of the Brotherhood. He says, no, there is no vengeance within our temples. We are about love, benevolence, forgiveness, and sacred uh, sacred calling of true brotherhood for all human beings. And again, uh, the sheer goodness radiating from this music is compelling indeed. <laughs> As for those trials, here's what's important to understand. The first trial is that of silence. Tamino is forbidden to speak to his true love, Pamina. And that's his first trial. But you must understand that it is also Pamina's first trial, because she has to endure the heartbreak of not understanding why her lover has suddenly turned cold and will not engage with her. Uh, so that is her trial, and they both must remain loyal and endure this sacrifice. And this is, uh, causes uh, Pamina to sing that most beautiful aria, which to me always reminds me of the depth and heartfelt tragedy of many of the slow movements to Mozart's uh, fabulous piano concertos. So, as, and also, as you listen to uh, just a portion of this aria, Ach ich Fuss, understand that in the rhythm of the string accompaniment underneath that you're going to hear more Masonic imagery because uh, 
Pamina is in that darkened state of unenlightened confusion and ignorance. She doesn't understand why she must endure the silence of her uh, beloved. And to underscore that, in the strings, uh, in the rhythmic figure accompanying her, you have this long, short, long, short, long. Again, the limping symbolism of the crippled soul, the spirit that has not yet become strong through enlightenment. who heretofore had reservations about their new candidates for brotherhood, and in the case of Pamina sisterhood, are now impressed with the way Tamino sails through this first trial. Now they're rooting for him. He still has some trials to undergo, but they're on board. They are all in for Tamino. And so you get a chorus in which the priests are going to pray to Isis and Osiris, uh, to enable this candidate to go from dark to light. And Mozart will choose a most powerful way using dynamics from pianis a soft pianissimo to a thunderous choral fortissimo of illustrating this concept, this most important Masonic symbolism of darkness to light. As we mentioned earlier, when Tamino begins to face his final trials of fire and water, the last steps for membership, his beloved, his uh, holy uh, wife, Pamina, who will enter into him both into the temple of wisdom and light and into the sanctified bonds of marriage, Pamina, she is joining him hand in hand. They are together together. Finally, as a unified couple, the two flesh becoming as one symbolically. And oh, by the way, remember that leaping sixth da, nya, da, 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 that we heard in the overture and in Tamino's love aria? Would you please get a Q-tip, clean out your ears, and listen to Pamina's opening phrase and in this love duet? And understand, no, this love duet doesn't sound as passionate and erotic as those in Tosca or Madame Butterfly. That's because this is not erotic, sensual love. This is holy love. And 
there they are, the fun couple, Tamino and Pamina. Let's have them over for dinner next week. Uh, once they, but let's get them through their trials first. And what about Papageno? Uh, what's happened to him? Oh, he's very much present in Act Two because guess what? He's also going to go through trials, and he will fail, 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 epic fail, as they say these days. Uh, you know, pa Papageno gets his trial of silence. Oh, I'll be silent. You'll see. No, sir. Wild horses couldn't get me to talk. You'll see. I'll be the quietest person there. I mean, fail. Uh, here's a feast, Papageno. Don't touch it. I won't. Actually, I'm kind of hungry. Gobble, 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 gobble. Everything he's given uh, is a total failure. He sings a song that we don't have time to hear about what he really just wants in life as a girlfriend. Please, some. can I just have a pretty girl to kiss? He shakes the magic bells that uh, the three ladies had given him for times of trouble, and a girlfriend shows up. The only trouble is she appears to be 130 years old, and she's all wrinkled and says, Hello, lover boy! And he's very disappointed and is rude to her. And, oh, it turns out that if he had only shown faith and passed that trial, really underneath her cloak she was a gorgeous little bird girl with a figure like Marilyn Monroe, and, you know, and then he's failed again. So... What? Too bad for him? Terrible to be Papageno? Sad ending? No, because what Mozart wants us to understand symbolically is, again, just as college education isn't for everybody, neither is Freemasonry, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with going through life just attending to basic human needs of love, food, drink, companionship, children, family. That's fine. Not everybody is an intellectual. Uh, Mozart understood that there were Papaganos out in the audience, and perhaps you, dear radio listener, are a Papagano. Perhaps you don't care about all this, and you go to the magic flute because you like seeing the snake, and you like the special effects, and you want to hear the merry melodies. Mozart would say, I have no problem with that. You can lead a happy life and never know anything about Freemasonry. But for those who are like the Queen of the Night, those whose minds might be changed, and for those like Tamino, whose minds should be changed, listen to what I have said and believe that we're not bad. And as for Papageno, actually, because it's okay to be an, a non-intellectual, he gets his bird girl at the end and sings the cutest darn duet ever written in the history of opera. and her three ladies, uh, after one more attempt to bring back Pamina, Zarastra will banish them to eternal darkness. So what does that mean? They're dead? No. Remember, what does darkness mean? What does night mean in this opera? Does it mean death? No. It means ignorance and lack of wisdom. Zarastra is saying, you people who are you know, you know, we all know people like this. My mind is made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. We find this in every walk of life. Mozart knew it. That's the queen of the night. She's not going to have her uh, mind changed. So she's being banished, not to death, but Mozart's saying, okay, you're just going to remain ignorant. I understand that. Uh, not everybody's mind can be changed. They will remain confused for the rest of their lives. And what about you? Are you a 
Papageno, are you a queen of the night or are you a Tamino? For the Taminos out there, you must understand that I've shown you the tip of the iceberg here about uh, about all the Masonic meaning of the magic flute. If you find you're interested in this, I have a book to recommend you. Go to Amazon.com or your library or wherever you buy your reading material and look for a book called Mozart the Freemason by Jacques Henry. It is not long. It's not terribly difficult reading. It's really very interesting and absorbing. He lays out Mozart's entire history with Freemasonry and all the musical significances and dramatic symbolism that you find in the magic flute. And I think knowledge is a good thing. Um, there's no reason you can't enjoy the magic flute and, and ignore all of this and just take it at face value. But Mozart would be so pleased if you came to it with a little bit of your own enlightenment, which I hope we've been able to provide this afternoon. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you at the opera.